most likely my son was going to go before me. My son, Lion, passed away three months ago, and he battled 27-year illness with cancer. Where I'm sitting is where he died. His disease is, is one in a million. Literally, statistically. One in a million, statistically. This lifetime is one page in a book that never ends. And like, what are you going to do with that page? How are you going to write that story? And not everyone's going to relate to your story and everyone's going to relate to my story, but I believe with every story, there is something you can pull from it. I feel that he came here to show people how to live. And then at the end, he showed people how to die. That's remarkable. Barbie, thank you for being here. Absolutely. It's my favorite conversation. I know. I know. <laughs> Sports? Yeah. Death. I'm like, let's talk about death, baby. I mean, it's literally, I think people run for the hills sometimes because I'll dive right into how many people I've lost, the ceremony around it. Like it's, I think because I've been um, engulfed in so much, death and dying, that it's like at the forefront of my brain. And it's this mission in life that I need to um, create ceremony and remove the fear. So it's like, I want everyone to know, um, but I have to be really mindful of how I drop those little nuggets, mm -hmm. but it is my favorite conversation. So yeah, that mindfulness is part of the conversation, how, how the stigma and the tabooness, as I put in like my bio regarding this podcast, yeah. that there is a stigma to it. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reaching out to more cultures and I want to, I want to get more of a worldly view on it. Cause I think Maybe the Western view, or at least America, it's definitely specific with that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, what better place to speak than this room right now? I, for everyone to learn where we are exactly, I would love to you explain before we get into yeah. your story the room that we're in yeah. right now. Yeah, so my son, Lion, passed away three months ago, and he battled a long 27-year uh, illness with cancer Um he had a genetic mutation that caused different ailments in his body, but ultimately um, he was put on hospice and uh, he was in this room and where I'm sitting is where he uh, died and left this world. And instead of, you know, this is part of that taboo. This is part of, you know, you walk into a house and there's a closed door and, you know, don't open that door. Don't go in that room. Someone died in there. Don't touch anything. Don't take anything. Um, it's either, you know, a family member is just so traumatized to let anything go or change anything. They're holding on or it becomes a scary stigmatic room of there's death and dying and fear and just don't even go in there. And so, you know, that's not how we sat in his death. You know, we created this beautiful ceremony and, um, you know, his friends and I, after he passed, just sat in here on the floor. You know, the first thing we did was got rid of the medical bed. We were like, just that represented suffering that needs to go. And we just sat on the floor in here. And five days later, we're like, we've got to get, we have to make this the lion's den. That's beautiful. And, yeah. It's rare, it's rare to, hear, to hear that, honestly. I mean, I, I don't know too many people that had someone passed away in a specific room that you're currently living in, you know? Yeah. And to have that perspective of essentially, I guess, switching the societal taboo over. It obviously it wasn't your personal taboo. Yeah. Was that a process or was that something that you just always believed in with death and that you wanted to create this space? Did it, was it a feeling in the moment or something it's, you always no, believed No, it's in? absolutely not something I always felt. You know, I grew up um, with boomer parents and the truth is it was generational where a century ago we handed our ceremonial and ritual rites of death and dying to the medical, the Western medical world and replaced it with fear. It was like someone died, take the body, we don't know what to do. And throughout the last century, it's just grown bigger and bigger where we have no idea what to do with our loved ones. Mm -hmm. You know, we, um, so I grew up with this deep fear, but a curiosity, mm -hmm. like, why can't I go say goodbye? Why can't I go to the memorial? Why can't, you know, and I was always too young or, um, you know, I was just, so there was this feeling of there wasn't closure. You know, I would leave, um, you know, a situation where someone passed and it was just that underbelly of that there should be more, there wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. And um, I lost both of my brothers and um, my second brother or the first brother actually really created this, it opened the door, you know, his passing opened the door to this curiosity. And um, my second brother was a firefighter and he was on on life support for 17 days and came out of it. And after that, um, I just knew I needed to know everything 
there possibly was to know about the process of death and dying. And I became a death doula and then a death midwife. And um, I worked in hospice. And I think subconsciously I knew that I would be sitting with my son one day and I really wanted to um, understand everything I possibly could about the process. Um, so it was, it was this evolution. It was curiosity. It was, I know there's more and I know this doesn't feel right. And, um, so, you know, coming into lion's passing, um, you know, I, I had all this information and this confidence because I had done it for other people. And, you know, we did a living memorial for him and, you know, just created ceremony in every single thing we did. And, and the act of his passing too was, uh, was a beautiful ceremony. Can you, can you tap into what you said in the middle of that regarding you subconsciously felt you'd be sitting with your son that he would be passing? Well, you know, he was four years old when he was diagnosed and it was terminal, you know, it, it, in the sense there was no cure, you know, and ultimately, um, you know, in 1999, when he was diagnosed, um, with Gardner syndrome, his first tumor was in 1996, but, there was no internet. There was no Google. I just knew he had Gardner syndrome and I knew that it was, it would eventually take him out. So I didn't know how much time he had. And that was something I sat with. Does he have five years? Does he have 40 years? Like, you know, I had heard of people living till they were 50, 60 with this disease. I would see people leave at seven years old. Like I just didn't know. So it was this unknown. Um, we didn't leave any stone unturned. You know, I traveled around the world and every healer, Eastern, Western, stem cells in Germany, everything I can possibly do. But I knew ultimately there was a fate to this disease. And so, you know, trying to find comfort in my mama heart, knowing that most likely my son was going to go before me. Um, I needed to know that as a mom, I can show up for him the best way I could as a mom, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like I would do anything for him while he was living and I will do anything for him in the process of dying. So, so obviously that's something you th you've thought about when it comes to the dying process yeah. and especially the experience of your son understanding and thinking that he might not live for very long based on the circumstances. Yeah. But is that, is that something you've contemplated even deeper with like asking that dangerous question? Why? Like, do, do you find meaning in the reasoning of his disease, or do you even think about that? I do, 100%. Um, you know, it's his disease is, is one in a million. Um, Literally, statistically? One in a million, statistically. And it's genetic. And his father and I, neither of us carried the gene. And the chance of him mutating on his own is a 3% chance. So you get a one in a million disease and a 3% chance on top of that of him mutating on his own. So I person again, this is my belief system, but, um, and I hate to use the word karmic disease because people interpret that as he was like an ax murderer in a past life. And this is his punishment. And it has nothing to do with that. I feel that, um, and I was able to discuss this with my son, you know, throughout his life. And especially at the end that, uh, there was a reason why he came with so much suffering um, and he was a teacher. I mean, he was like master energy. I'm not putting him on a pedestal to like make him some guru, but he had this power to change the narrative and the dialogue with suffering. You know, anyone else would have been, um, you know, just carried the rocks in their backpack. Like this happened to me and I'm a victim and my life is over. And he never had that mentality. It's like he came here to live and show people how to live with a terminal illness. So I feel that this disease was part of his blueprint that him and, you know, God signed up for this, um, knowing that he was going to be able to change thousands of people um, by the way he walked through it. It was, her, it was his perception. Mm -hmm. You know, he... He was a force. What, what was his perception? Like, how, how did he go about? His perception, you know, from early on, you know, he had a colectomy when he was seven years old. And, um, you know, I share there was this little boy in the hospital. Uh, he was five years old. He was on his fifth liver transplant and he didn't get the morphine pump. And his parents were immigrants and couldn't be, you know, in the hospital with him. And I you know, Lion had abundant family members 24 hours a day with a morphine pump. And so we use that as this perspective throughout the rest of his life. You remember Alejandro, like it can always be worse. 
like yours isn't that bad. And so he always, you know, anytime he was in deep suffering, he would always look at me and say, mom, I know it can always be worse. It can always be worse. It's not that bad. And his, you know, perspective was this is happening. This moment is impermanent because I know there's going to be, you know, some relief, some sense of relief. And within that space, I'm going to go do everything I can to live. And if you look around, there's him riding motorcycles and there's him surfing. And the truth is like this kid was swam with great white sharks in Australia, was towed in um, sunset, 30 foot waves, um, mavericks. Like he lived so big with ports, with pick lines, with drains, with tumors, in between chemo, in between surgeries and nothing stopped him. So I feel that he came here to show people how to live. And then at the end, he showed people how to die. That's remarkable, yeah. and, that, and that gives that gives uh, to me that makes sense. You know, giving that meaning to the suffering, yeah. especially someone. I'm sure the way he lived his life through suffering, it almost makes it not only easier for people that are going through similar things, but for you guys, right? Like, yeah. The idea that you're my son, yeah, he's dying, but look at the way he's living his life. He lived so big in 31 years, um, like beyond someone who lived 90 years. You know, and, and it was a perspective of, you know, I don't feel good all the time. So when I do, I'm going to go big. Or I'm going to go home. You know, it was like he went full throttle and he went full throttle till the very end. And not everyone can do that. And he showed a lot of people how to live. You know, it's so beautiful. I, we would have our, we called them um, bathroom diaries, like toilet talk. At the <laughs> end, he would spend like 18 hours in the bathroom because he had, fistulas, which are tear in the, tears in the intestine and holes throughout his body. And, um, you know, bodily fluids would be coming out of them all the time. So I'd have to sit on the floor and clean them up, clean all the fluid up while he'd be, you know, going to the bathroom. And, and um, you know, we talked about it. And, you know, like six days before he died, I was like, I just want you to know how proud I am of you. Like, I am so proud of you. And he died a week before Christmas. And I said, this is the biggest Christmas gift that you could ever give me is showing me how brave you are. And this life so fulfilled, like I'm left with like immense gratitude for mm. the 31 years that I got to be your mom and how you lived and, you know, the example you set, like, in, and I still hold on to that gratitude. You know, I... um you know, I'm not walking around with this emptiness of, you know, I lost my son and this happened to me and I should have gone first. Like, I don't see it that way. Um, you know, I have a lot of people on the other side and I just visualize them all together. And, you know, him and I got to talk about that. Like this lifetime is one page in a book that never ends. And like, what are you going to do with that page? How are you going to write that story? And how, how do you instill that in other people? Because obviously there's, we've, pre-recording we discussed the different beliefs out there and people are you know stuck to their ideations and almost the same way like you know in a similar way you are like we you have your beliefs yeah. and some people have beliefs just as with just as much conviction on the opposite side right yeah that may be looking at it in a different way this they might only see the suffering and maybe really deep in their grief which is understandable yeah but how do you how do you instill obviously without sticking it down someone's throat but how do you instill that peace within losing your son only three months ago by example hmm. by example I don't think it's anything I can like sit down and instill like what I feel into you, mm -hmm. but I can walk through this differently and people can see how I'm walking through this. And so much of it is because he lived so big and because we sat with his dying and because we addressed the elephant in the room, you know, people would come in and be like, they wouldn't know how to approach him. He was like a hundred pounds, you know, when he was six foot one, when he died, he was skin and bones. And they would look at him and be like, you, you look great. And I would look at him. I'm like, no, you don't like <laughs> yeah. you're dying, honey. And yeah. we would like kind of wink and start laughing. Like we addressed the elephant in the room and we had dark, dark death humor. Um, That's right on par with me. We had to, like <laughs> yeah. when he, we would say the funniest stuff where we'd be cracking up and people would like, they wouldn't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But I was like, we're not going to like pretend like this isn't happening. Mm -hmm. So there was this sense of closure. There was the ceremony. There was, you know, our understanding of the other side is, you know, I'm not, I'm not stuck to any particular religion, you know, but I've lost a lot of people and I've, there's been a lot of signs and messages from the other side that have made it very clear that there's more. 
And I'm, that, I'm, we're going to get into those signs because I'm very fascinated with that as we discussed. But what were the last moments like with your son? Um, well, it was a 24-hour party. Um, he went on, he decided to go on hospice November 29th and we recorded every session. Um, and you know, it was the first couple days he was like, I can't believe this is really happening. And I have video. We would, I would interview him all the time. I'm like, what does it feel like to die? Oh, wow. Oh yeah. No, we would like, we went deep and he was like, well, I'm just kind of waiting to feel like I'm dying. Like, I know my body looks like I'm dying. He's like, but my mind doesn't feel that way. So it's kind of weird. Like, they tell me I'm dying, but I don't really feel like I'm dying. So every single day, we would kind of go a little further with these conversations. And I'm like, do you feel like you're dying yet? And I have them all recorded. I'll listen to them. And I'm like, is anyone visiting you yet? Like, (laughs) And we would talk about, like, the first thing you're going to be able to do is manipulate energy, your energy. Like, your soul is all energy. So, like, what are you going to do? Are you going to, like, you know, what songs are you going to play me? Are you going to flicker the lights? Like, my daughter, him, uh, the two of them used to cook all the time. Every time she's in the kitchen, three flickers, three flickers. Regularly? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, he was like, I'm going to I'm gonna mess with your lights. Mm-hmm. Um, so, it's been, like... Um, you know, so we would have these like amazing conversations. Um, and then on 11 days before he passed, you know, I, I said, you know, what, sweetie, you can wait until you're gone to have this memorial and everyone can cry and say what they want to say to you. Um, but you're not going to be here for it. Or we can do this raging living memorial and we can have like your fantasy food and invite everyone you want to be there and everyone can hug you and tell you how much they love you. And it's going to be emotional, but then they have closure and you have closure. And then there's no stone left unturned. And he was like, let's do it. That's I'm like, amazing. Okay. So we like five 30 in the morning, put like the meat on the Traeger and just had this whole crazy meal planned. And 200 people ended up coming to this house. And it's not a big house. So the whole backyard was packed and you know, he went out and there were moments, it was emotional. He would come in, um, you know, with me and his two siblings and kind of process and cry. And then he would go back out there, but he was like comforting his friends, hugging them. And, you know, there were a lot of tears, but it was so beautiful. And we have that all on video, just the hugs and the embraces and the goodbyes. And he was like, it's not goodbye. It's just see you later. Like, I'm going to be there to greet you and I'll see you on the other side. And, you know, so many people were like, I've never thought of a living memorial. I, I didn't even know it was a thing. And I'm like, when you think about it. I'm getting the chills. Why would we wait? You yeah. know what I mean? Why Why couldn't he receive that while he was in his body and like give them the final hug? Mm-hmm. Because when people die, it's like, I wish I could have said that. But it's so hard to get those words out if the elephant's in the room. <laughs> like, I'm scared to address the fact that you're dying because I don't know how you're sitting with that. So we opened that space up for everyone. That makes sense. I mean, just just to relate it from my personal understanding in regards to even when people think like my conversation comes to loop by my loss of my dad in particular, yeah. and specifically with the conversation around the 9-11, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. Once I crack my stupid jokes and just, it's like I'm opening that door, then all of a sudden the floodgates come in and people are like, oh, this is okay. We got, yeah. we got kind of past that little hurdle. Yeah. And now you can see the people, they want to ask questions. You want, you want to ask some questions that you may think that person may be receptive negatively or too emotionally. But once you take the elephant out of the room, yeah. it does open that dialogue and people can be more comfortable. But you guys did that in a way that is unbelievable. Yeah. Like that is like a, for me, that's like a, if, if I'm fortunate enough, I have this conversation about like, you know, the, the quick death, this or that, but it's, and they have their pros and cons, I suppose, but to have that opportunity to have like a living party, I yeah. personally wouldn't want it any other way. So the fact that you did that is remarkable. But that's how Lion lived. He was so social and had such big energy and so many people loved him that he needed that and everyone else needed that. And so that was on August I mean, uh, December 5th, he died on the 17th. So within that time span of 12 more days, um, it was a party. It was a raging party. So he had friends come over every single day, every night. And I said, let's make a list of every fantasy meal you want before you die. 
what is that? It was like sushi. It was ribs. It was lobster boil. I mean, every like fantasy meal. And so all of his boys slept in the living room. So the last week they never left. They were here. They took work off. They were here 24 hours a day. We would all take turns. There would always be um, you know, a motocross or surf contest on the TV. There were three people in the bed, hospice nurse right here. Hit, one boy would be sitting in the wheelchair. One boy would be sitting in the, on the commode. I mean, hysterical, eating cups of candy. And, you know, line would kind of be in and out, but that's what he wanted. He wanted everyone around. And, um, you know, I was exhausted. And sure. the funniest was there were two times that we almost lost him. Like we called Harper, his youngest brother, home from school. I'm like, he's going, come home. He would come home. We would all be like vigil around the bed. And then he would open his eyes and he'd be like, I'm still fucking here. <laughs> and we were like, oh my God. And I'm like, I thought you were dead. He's like, how long was I out? And I was like, dude, like your <laughs> oxygen was like down to 60. We have like the oxygen on him and- he Unreal. would just be like, where's my vape? Like, <laughs> where's my vape? <laughs> it was hysterical. So we would just be like cracking up and then he would come out of it. And he'd be like, okay, so the lobster boil on Thursday night. And we're like, it's Sunday. Like, you think you're going to make it till Thursday? And he was like, oh no, I'm, I'm going to make it till Thursday. So the lobster boil, and we're like, honey, the lobster boil is a really big deal. We've got to get like all the pots and all the, he was so adamant about the lobster boil. And we were all cracking up. We were like, this fucking lobster boil. Like, is he for real? <laughs> and we're like, you know what? We got to do the lobster boil. Course, yeah. And so we did the lobster boil on Thursday night. And it was in the backyard. And we lined up all these tables. And I was like, this is like Jesus's final supper. <laughs> I was like, this is it, honey. This is your final meal. Like, we're wrapping it up. And it was lobster, crab, corn. Like, the boys went all out. And he probably had like 20 friends here and we wheeled him out in the wheelchair. He took like two bites of lobster and that was his final meal. And right after that he went? No, no, no. He died Sunday, but on Thursday, Thursday night was his final meal. It was like the final supper, like the lobster boil. He hung on because one of his friends could come up. He was a motocross rider on Thursday night. So he like wanted to make sure he was there. Mm. So he like held out till Thursday night and then that night got brutal. And then it got really rocky Friday, Saturday. And he finally left us on Sunday. Oh man, I've never, I, like you said, most people probably were thinking about the the living memorial. Is that what you call it? The living yeah, memorial? Yeah, living memorial. It's, uh, it's such a genius idea if you do have that opportunity. Again, the fact that you put the elephant, t- took the elephant out of the room or exposed the elephant in the room, it just makes it easier for everyone else. But uh, out of the people, all the 200 people that you said showed up, was there, were there any mixed responses to this to this memorial? Was everyone kind of on board and understood no, what was going no, on? No, you know, it was really beautiful. It was so foreign to, I think, 99.9% of the people that were there. Um But everybody met Lion where he was at. Like, there was this honor that came into it. Like, if this is what he wants, we're going to rise up, even if it's uncomfortable for us, and meet him where he's at. And, you know, our community in Malibu is amazing. Mm -hmm. And they have rallied around him. And, you know, he has his core boys that they, like, fought the Woolsey Fire together. And they've been friends since they were Groms. And they've been through a lot. And, and, you know, this whole— Malibu showed up for him and they always have. It's been throughout the years, you know, fundraisers. And so, no, everyone rose to the occasion. It was, it was really beautiful to watch, you know, and so many people said to us, like, you know, you're changing our perspective on what this looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, you're inviting us in to have a different experience and like, thank you. That's the powerful thing. Like you mentioned, you used the word karmic and this or that, but the, I think that's the powerful, con- uh, almost misconception, but for me, the the realness of when someone passes, there's such a ripple effect, and it can go either way. Obviously, people yeah. handle this experience totally different. They can go down, they can go up. But when you look at it from the lens of that perspective that you're talking about, it not only gives meaning and closure to the way, especially the way Lion, I mean, I I'm, I wish I got a chance to meet him, but I, I'm happy that you're explaining him so thoroughly because I'm getting a good idea yeah. of who the heck he was. And it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. <laughs> he was big. It's pretty badass. <laughs> and so it's like that effect that be, I'm, not, I'm not saying everyone has to live this lioness life for lack right. of better terms, but at the same time, the effect that someone's life has on you, even though they pass and it's sad, like obviously you still want them there. Yeah. But that, that linger that they leave is so impactful as long as you look at it like that. You yeah. know what I mean? So I think the, again, the perspective that besides the process that you've had through that and the party and all that, it's like, 
you're, he changed people's perspectives living like that. But even if someone didn't live as impactful as he did in, in many ways, it's like you can look at it that way. You can look yeah. at it what what he left, what the person left behind, the life they lived, and how now your perspective shifted through the sadness or through the grief. It's like it, it impacts the rest of your life. And yeah. there's so many of the experiences I haven't had, and there's in my head like worse experiences that plenty of people have had way more than me. So I'm not even saying I've been through it all, but losing someone is just. And it's so natural. It's so it's such an impactful way, but it's so natural. So it's like it makes sense that it's natural, yeah. Because of how impactful it is. But I want to ask you in regards to it's only been three months, yeah. And obviously you have a beautiful perspective, and you seem like you're in a good place. But do you still have those any moments of pain at this point, or you kind of you feel freed? If- um, you know, it's it's weird because I'll check in with myself, you know, and I'm like, gosh, it's only been three months. And am I supposed to be grieving a certain way? That's a dangerous word too, right? Am I, am am I supposed to look like other moms who have lost their children? And, and, you know, my heart hurts for them, you know, in a, in a, in a deep, deep way. Um, them meaning other other people or other people who maybe don't have the perspective I do. Right. And, um, so I have those moments where the reality that he's gone, um, because he was my best friend, you know, he lived with us and we did everything together. And I had him when I was 17 years old. So, you know, it was lying and I against the world, you know, for years. And, um, you know, he's the first, my first love. He, he showed me how to love. And, you know, there were, there's so many layers to our soul's journey. And so all, when I go too deep in it, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's, he's not here. Like I can't, you know, he was so affectionate and he, he was a mama's boy. You know, I just, it was always like, I love you, mama. Guilty for sure. You know, it was like, you're the best mama. Like he would do anything for me. And so missing that piece where I'm like, oh wow, like, okay, he's not here anymore. But then I close my eyes and I visualize him with my brothers and I visualize him with my grandma and I visualize him free from suffering and from this body and I smile. And then I remember that I got to walk him to that veil. Mm. Like I, I got to be his mama to the very end and he needed me so bad. And if I would have gone first, he wouldn't have had me and he needed his mama at that moment. And so there's this gratitude of how it unfolded and the beauty in it. And so like, I'm left smiling. So I, you'll never find me in fetal position with a box of tissues. In the beginning, it was like processing, you know, the first couple of weeks, just like what just happened, but I knew it was coming. So Mm -hmm. it wasn't a shock. And, you know, a situation like your dad and tragic losses, like I feel um, there was the gift of suffering. Mm-hmm. Like I got to prepare for it and it is a gift and not everyone gets that, you know? So if someone is terminal and in that process, like take advantage of that time because not everybody gets that. So I was grateful for that as well. Yeah. The gift of suffering. It's a very powerful way to look at it. Yeah. It's, it's, and again, it's, uh, you use the word supposed to this or that. I think that's a very convoluted word. Yeah. It's, I mean, literally anything. Like we're supposed to do this. Was like I, I don't want to be rude, but shut up. It's like supposed to do. Like I don't yeah. supposed to. I don't, <laughs> I don't even know what I'm supposed to do when I yeah. make breakfast. Like I say, I, I don't. The word supposed to is just. I, I don't know. I think society's standards. You know, I, I I don't know. You know, I grief is a weird thing, and it's like walking through molasses, mm. and every single person's grief is different, and yes. it looks different, and they react different, and and like all three of my brothers and my son, all of their passing was so different. My first one was a skateboarding accident. Like he was there and then he was on life support. And then we said goodbye, but we didn't really get to say goodbye. And then my other brother, you know, had COVID and we found him four days later in his truck, you know, so there was no closure there. And then Lion, like, we got the closure, you know, so they all felt so different. Were the other ones, your other losses, were they more of an emotional impact? I'm not saying you're not feeling your emotions, but you know what I mean? Like it was No, just, they, they were, they yeah. were because, um, you know, it was, there were things left unsaid, you know, with my first brother, I remember we were in Germany doing stem cells and I got a call that he was in a skateboarding accident. He was skating a pool and wasn't wearing a helmet. And he had emailed me, a few days before and sent me this video at the top of Mammoth. And 
Um, we didn't have Wi-Fi, so I saw that email and I'm like, I'm going to respond when I get home because I don't really, you know, I have like three minutes of Wi-Fi. It was, you know, um, back in 2005 and we were in like the Bavarian Alps. And mm. so I didn't respond. So that haunted me. You know, I was like, I should have responded and I didn't get to, I didn't get to tell him how much. And the last time I saw him was on Christmas. And did I tell him I loved him? And so there were, there were things left unsaid. You know, like I, I had to recap it all. And there was like this emotional train that came with that. And then my other brother, you know, luckily I went back. The last text I sent to him was he was at the hospital waiting for a room and he ended up leaving. And I just said, I love you so much. We can do hard things. Like, please stay. I love you. So there was a little piece there. It's like you went through uh, almost schooling to prep you for a lion's yeah. transition. Yeah. And that and that's the big thing about we're talking. It's like is you know, it was not everyone gets, has to go through the, uh, the hard knocks of experiencing one, two, three losses or whatever we're going through. And that's experience. That's literally experience with everything. And yeah. it hopefully wisens you up for the next time. Yeah. And that's why, I've, and again, these conversations are not for everyone, but I think they should be for everyone because the day is going to come and they I can take, they and, and, not, and not everyone's going to relate to your story and everyone's yeah. going to relate to my story, but I believe with every story, there is something you can pull from it. Yeah. I mean, you know, I used to tell lie all the time. I'm like, no one's getting out alive. Mm-hmm. You know, no one, I think people are under this illusion that they're going to escape death somehow, some way. And, you know, it's hard for them to wrap their head around. Like, you know, I sit in reality knowing I don't know when my time is. It may be tomorrow. It may be in 50 years. Like, I don't get to know that. My mm-hmm. soul knows that, but I don't get to know that. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's just a matter of time. So we Literally. might as well kind of get comfortable with it, you know, sit in the uncomfortableness and become intimate with this idea of death and dying and accept the unacceptable, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's so, it's this, this shit's fascinating to me. Cause I, again, like, I think maybe it's just the unknown that, that, you know, constitutes the fear, this or that. And then that's, and the fear is why we want to believe in something and why people get so hung up on their beliefs because yeah. it's like a safety net. And then when you go against those beliefs, people feel attacked. But I, in regards to those beliefs and we had the discussion about, you know, okay, he's not physically here but you feel comfort in visualizing and feeling like mm-hmm. he's here. Yeah. What are some of those stories that show you that he's still around or that the other side is still active in our reality? Th- th- let's start with the rainbow. And anyone who knows Lion knows how he has been showing us the craziest amounts of rainbows. And we discussed all these things. I said, what number sequence are you going to show me? What medium do you want to work with? Um, you know, we we discussed all the ways he was going to communicate from the other side. And we left the rainbow out because we didn't know of the rainbow. But I took the kids to Costa Rica right after he died. And um, we got lost in these mountains. And we end up and we're like, you know, where are we? We just did this whole circle. And all of a sudden, the most vibrant rainbow, like full rainbow right in front of us. And we were like, whoa, like this is insane. And after that, like he was showing us, like, you guys are okay. And then we found our way right after that. And And you felt it. Oh, yeah. No, we felt we were crying. It was like, you are here and you're letting us know. Like, it's like the peace beyond, Mm. you know, the beauty beyond. Um, And the message was so clear. And then... um, and then I saw, I worked with a medium. I've seen many mediums since he's left. And um, and she said, is he, does he keep showing you rainbows? He keeps showing me rainbows. Get out. And I was like, yes. And so his paddle out was February 4th. We planned it 2424. It was this, you know, cool sequence. And I was like, like, bring us a rainbow. Like, bring us a rainbow. <clears throat> like, random. All of a sudden, the atmospheric river starts rolling in on February 4th. Um, it was that crazy, crazy storm in the morning. It was like partly cloudy, hadn't really come yet. And we get down to the beach and there is the most insane rainbow. And there's been like 40 more times where I've never seen this many rainbows ever in my life. So that's just like one little example. Um, you know, he comes to me in my dreams, um, number sequences, there's just, it's like undeniable. And mm-hmm. we're always like, hey, lie. Oh, he said he was coming back as a red tail hawk. What? Oh, yeah. He was like, look for the red tail hawk. I'm this, gonna... You had this conversation with him. He said, he said, oh, yeah. You know, we went over every single detail. It's like, what animal are you going to show up as? Like, what? All of it. He was like, red tail hawk. So all his boys got like, some of them got tattoos of red tail hawks. It's like, we've honored That's him amazing. deeply. <laughs> That's and, so um, awesome. So on Christmas Eve, 
you know, it's literally six days after he died. And, and, you know, I'm one person who no matter what will continue tradition, like world doesn't stop because someone died. Like Mm -hmm. I've got other kids, we've got family. He wants us. So we just, you know, had an empty space at the table for him with the cross and a picture and, and the tree up there, all of a sudden this red tail hawk comes down and goes in between our two houses. And it's like, come on. And we're like, okay, you're here. You're with us. And that's going to feel so good. Especially, I mean, this is, you have a very unique situation to have a conversation with your son saying, (laughs) I'm a red tail fox, look for these numbers. And then it happens. I know. That is a remarkable, that's a remarkable feat to be a part of. I know. What what about the rest of your family? Like how how does everyone else process this? So, um, so good, good, because we talk about it. You know, Mm -hmm. it's not, you know, I grew up in a house where, you know, someone died, you don't ask questions and you don't talk about it because people, I I think the elders just didn't know what to say and they didn't know how to sit with it. Um, And that led to the curiosity that I had. And so in this house, it's like, we have an altar in the living room with my brothers and lion's ashes, a candle lit all the time. There's ashes in here, you know, so it's like, we all sit with it. So I've invited them in and now my daughter, um, wants to work with me. And so she's going to do her death doula training and, um, become a death midwife as well. Now, what's the difference between the two death doula? So and death midwife? doula, um, is kind of up into the passing. You have to do that course. And then death midwifery is the aftermath. So it's oh. like, so I'm trained to, you know, sit with the body for three days with dry ice and I'm a minister and I can perform ceremony and, uh, you know, funerals and just all the after, you know, cremation, burial alternatives. Um, so there's a lot to the process. It's like, you know, consciously dying and, you know, um, what is the, you have to be adaptable in regards to the the death and the people, there's other variables. Everybody is so different. You know, everybody's belief system, everybody's life they lived. Um, and people, you know, tend to die the way they lived. You know, they really do. It's like, if, you know, you have someone who is angry and bitter throughout life, they're that that's going to come out as they're dying. You know, there's going to be, um, you know, anger. <laughs> is it ever the opposite? Like not opposite, but I mean, say someone lived a an angry and bitter life. Was there any form of, oh shit, I was angry this whole time and kind of coming to? Yes, yes. And and they can have those moments of healing. And um, and I think it's important for family to be able to come in and hold space for that um, and allow the healing to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, the forgiveness. Um, I forgive you. I hope that you can forgive me and have those conversations. But the problem is, is, um, you know, people are scared to have those conversations because it it feels final at that point. If I say these things, then I'm actually, you know, putting in capital bold letters that this person is dying and I, and I can't even get it out of my mouth. And that is... (sighs) It's that's, the final. It's the finality that's scary. It's the finality. But then when you have stories like you're talking with this, with these numbers and these animals, it's like oh, well, this, the this ceremony. Ain't, this ain't I didn't final even as get shit. into the ceremony with his body. Oh, okay. Go on. So we were leading up to his passing, and um, you know, it, it, Thursday night, final supper, Friday, Saturday night were rough. And then he said, "Mama, you brought me into this world. Um, I want you to bring me out. I just want you." And uh, and so his hospice nurse told you know, came in and I was out in the living room and said, his blood pressure's dropping, you know, come in. And, um, and so I laid in bed with him and, um, he passed and I just laid with him for like 30 minutes. And we had a crew outside. There were probably 25 people just waiting outside. And, uh, and so once I was ready and I had sat with him, I invited, you know, his closest people in and they're like, what do we do? You know, they had never really seen a dead body and here's their friend and their brother and their loved one, you know, laying in the bed deceased. And I said, we're going to take his clothes off and then we're going to pull every drain and pick line out of his body. And, um, and so we, we stripped him and I said, let's get warm bins and washcloths. And there were like 12 hands bathing every inch of his body so gently and so beautifully. Wow. And then we took oil and, um, essential oils, you know, biblical oils, sandalwood, myrrh, frankincense, lavender. And we anointed his entire body. 
And then I put salt water all over his face and I put holy water on his crown. And then I shrouded him in this Indian cloth. And then we put earth on him and it was like flowers and dirt. And people were out foraging on the hill, like eucalyptus branches and flowers and sand. And we sat with him for eight and a half hours. And there were hundreds of people who came through into this room and just, you know, got to sit with his body and look at this beautiful ceremonial ritual that we got to do. And I invited them in and we had kids, we had four-year-olds, we had... You know, and it's like showing this next generation that it's okay. Like, mm. this is what we can do. And every single person that came and participated and put flowers on him in this room has shared with me that they got to experience something that they had no idea even existed. And the fear surrounding death and dying has now been removed. And so, like, for me, that is the most powerful work I can be doing, you know, because you ask anyone, what's your number one fear? It's dying. Mm -hmm. And what part of dying? It's typically the pain. Yeah. Right? Like, we don't know what that looks like, and it's different for everybody. But dying in itself, if we can remove the fear, knowing that it's ceremonial, and take that right back that we handed to the Western medical world mm -hmm. and reclaim that as ours and own it, it just – the world would be way less scary. Yeah, it's so real. And again, you use the word ritual. It just it just brings it back to how long – how long have – tribes and in history have ha still, and there's still other cultures that still have these yeah. more ritualistic approaches yeah. being with the body. And again, it just comes back to facing it. And I think removing the elephant, as we said several times, but it's almost like we're, your process is reverting back to tribal mechanisms yeah. that are still existing, of course, as it should but be. as have always been. And now it is that transition. It is that, that switch up with, I guess, the, you know, Western medicine, whatever it is, that has just made it so much more cold. Yeah. I mean, it's like embalming and open caskets with like, you know, drag queen makeup. Like, it's just not it, it, like, what is that? What, like, is, what is that? Did, where did that come from? We got to make the body look, it's like plastic like, surgery after you're that? dead. Like they're plastic. Like it's just, it's so bizarre to me when you think of like Hinduism and Buddhism and Africa and ceremony and these, it's like honoring this vessel, you know, that that lived this beautiful life. And it's the closure that family needs to find peace in the situation. And now it's like, they're dead. Take them to the morgue, pump them with like formaldehyde. And, you know, it, it's so unattached. Like there's a detachment between the human existence and death and dying that I feel so called to bridge that gap. Mm, beautiful. To bridge that gap and bring back the ceremonial rites and own that. Mm -hmm. We're those are our rights. We're allowed to have for our family and the ones we love. Yeah, in, in the traditional funeral, you know, how many times do people say after they go through the embalming and all that stuff, it's like, oh man, it doesn't even look like him or her. And I mean, obviously, after your body leaves, like, your soul, whatever you want, leaves it. You're not going to look the same, of course. No, it's not. You're not there. No, but it's like you're just you're fabricating. You it. have a stranger. You have a stranger decorating this vessel. Yeah, who the hell are you? Who didn't know, you know, it's like, it's the most bizarre thing. It is I so can't weird. wrap my head around it. I'm like, no. It is so weird. I mean, I love, I love your approach. I, and it's also something I think should be thought about even more. I, I, I think it's me personally, I mean, my weird ass head, but I, I think it's fun to have these mm -hmm. conversations. I just had, um, Nora McInerney on, I don't know if you know who she is, she's phenomenal. And she's an author, a podcast host, she's experienced loss and talks about grief a lot. And she did something along the lines of writing her their own, a practice of writing their own obituary, mm -hmm. which I thought was interesting and yeah. new. But my, my point with that is having these conversations, like how would you want yours to go? Like, yeah. I, I mean, I think Lion's process that you guys put together should be on, should be like pinned on up, up top of like <laughs> a great example of what to do. But even if that's not for you, it's an interesting thought to have that set up almost to have those yeah. thoughts. Like, how would you want your, yeah. what do you want people to do? Well, in our training and my death doula and midwifery training, we had to plan our own memorial to be able to sit with death. So we had to sit with our own death and our own immortality to be able to sit with anyone else's. It's like, you know, you can't love someone unless you love yourself. Amen. It's exact, so it's the yeah. same idea. Yeah. So we had to, and it was emotional, you know, it was like, what song do I want? Who do I want there? Who do I want to speak? What do I want? And then what do I want to be said about me? And how am I going to live my life to meet that story? And when did you do this? Sorry, what, what was this What was this for, specifically for a line or just in a practice you do no, with no, other no, people? No, 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 So I am a certified right. death uh, doula and midwife. So, so this is part of your process? 
Yeah. So it, in, it, when, it. in my training, got it, got it. Um, we had to do this. That should be an event. You just gave me an idea. Like that should be something that should just be for regular civilian folks. I mean, it's that'd amazing. Be, like and there's, fun- there's so many options. It's like, you know, um, cremation, you know, if, if someone suddenly passed and there wasn't closure, you can have, uh, a wooden cardboard box that they're cremated in and the family can decorate it and paint it and make it beautiful and write notes. And, you know, there's so many ceremonial things for closure that people don't know about. Mm -hmm. And you can make it your own, like whatever there's, I think you're going to, what you're, you've been trained and what you do can be used as well. Then whatever feels right. Right. Like I said, if you have other ideas, do it, but it is part of that healing process as opposed to just close the casket from yeah. all, from all the high to move on. It's like, it's, yeah. and I think the way I'm understanding it, correct me if I'm wrong, that closure is, I don't, I feel like I don't want people to misconstrue the closure of, okay, once you get that closure, that's it. Like, no, you can, you're continuing on with oh, the process. No, 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 the closure no. is that, that living, no. like that living closure before, like, up to the point where they die, right? Or it's up to the point where they die. If you're if, fortunate enough to have the experience if, that they're, if you're lucky, if they have the opportunity. Yeah. It, yeah. Lucky. And I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but. There's an act of, and I, and I bring these two words up, ceremony and ritual, so much because there's healing in that. And to be able to honor the transition in a ritual rite and ceremonial rites, there's a peace and a closure that you don't get, mm. you know, when it's embalmment and, you know, all these things. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't see it. And again, that's uh, throughout my entire life, that's been the whole process. I've never experienced something that you guys were. were put together and and it's beautiful like my stepdad now is on hospice and so the right when he went on a hospice i was like you ready for your living memorial what do you say like i'm and he was like okay (laughs) and i'm like let's bring it so we did it here and i had him in the seat and i invited you know everyone he loved and everyone sat and i recorded it everyone sat down and it was emotional people were crying and you know ask him one question one final question about his life And, you know, he got emotional and then it was like, and then tell him one final thing that you want to let him know. And then there were hugs and then we ate and we celebrated this life that he lived. And, um, you know, it, it was just so beautiful. It's Mm. just, it's, it's a different narrative. That's what it is. A different narrative. It's a different narrative. It's a different narrative. And I'm sure people will take it a million different ways on depending on where they're at with their life. But but that's a big thing too. It's like, I, I don't think depending on where people are like they're either leading up to it or whatever people are going to be completely different like not going to be as receptive possibly yeah. and i think that takes a practice in itself but again we said it a million times just a perspective shift and to me this is more calming this is, you're honoring them you're remembering them you're, yeah. you're not only doing it for the person that's passing but you're doing it for the people around you because we're going to the ones that are going to be left with you know the processing afterwards so just all encompassing I, i'm it's remarkable and again just sitting in this room again i wish i I wish I knew Lion, Lion, but again, the way you, I, I see him through you and the way you're explaining it, I feel honored to just sit in this space. I, not being someone that didn't get a chance to meet him, but I, I really appreciate you telling me a little about him and the people that are listening because this is it's very special for me to sit here. Yeah. And yeah. I, I really appreciate you just letting me in here. This is, and again, we have, we have, I know some of the people that knew Lion yeah. and, and that you know that I mentioned already. So it's, it's really powerful just to like sit in this room and I, I don't know if it, obviously you guys aren't going to feel this watching or listening, but it's, <laughs> it's pretty remarkable. It is. It's really special. And I love, I love your perspective on it. I love how you've continually honored your son and continue to help people through the process. So before we do get out of here, is there anything that you would say, or maybe you currently practice to people that are in the process of losing someone or have lost someone? Is there a, a very general statement, of course? Like, oh my gosh, you know what I mean? The, the, there's so many there's things so many. that just popped in because I am currently helping people in the beginning stages and the aftermath right now. And, and it's just all so different. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think just being open to bringing some sense of ceremony in, um, there's healing in every piece of that and living legacies. Um, so many people say, um, I'm, you're so lucky that you recorded him so much because now I can go back and hear his voice continuously. He did a video for us to the family 10 days before he died um, and left us all a message, you know, and, and a friend of his did that for us. And, you know, record as much as you can and ask questions and, you know, what were, what were your favorite memories in this lifetime and mm-hmm. your favorite vacations and get them talking because the truth is, the ones who are dying, 
the elephant in the room makes them uncomfortable because they know what's happening and they don't want to make you uncomfortable by addressing it. And it becomes this weird energetic thing. So it's like invite the dialogue mm. somehow, some way, video, record, get them, you know, get their voice recorded because you're going to want that. Yeah, I even... Uh I've been so sure. I, I even I, I say voicemails all the time, like little things like that. Yeah. Maybe it's not as proactive as some of the measures that you're talking about, but those that's the bless the beauty and the curse of these, you know, taking videos of everything. So like be in the moment, but then it's I don't look you at my I don't know. look at my photos you now all the know. time in certain moments, but yeah. it's gonna be nice to have down the road. Yeah. I, 222, he gives me all day, every day. But that was the number, yeah, two two two. That and was that was something number. Lion said two 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 that he, Yeah. What was the meaning of two 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 at the moment? He just 222 was my grandma's house that my daughter was born in. And then when my brother died, he gave us 222. And so I did, um, I did Lion's Sacred Paddle Out down at his beach that he was, you know, born and raised at on 222. And two years before I did my brother's sacred fire ceremony at Wishtoyo, our Shumash village. Um, so 222 has just been, and, and I said, what number sequence? He's like, you know, 222. That's so wild. every, I'll like lift up a bottle of face cream and there's a little sticker with, it's not an expiration date or a price. It just says 222. Like it's everywhere, mm. everywhere. So <sighs> well, yeah. For, well, for those of you that can't see, I'm looking at a beautiful photo, a badass photo of Lion with two middle fingers up saying fuck cancer, yeah. drinking out of a fuck cancer mug. So I feel like the best way to get it is to say fuck cancer, fuck and, cancer. and long live lion. Cause yeah. uh, this is a beautiful conversation and I you, respect Jamie. and really appreciate you talking to me. I know we just met and um, you know, you you give a very comforting energetic vibe with me right now. And I, it, it makes sense why you were uh, well, lion, lion was a mama's boy. Uh, thank you. So, yeah. So That's sweet. I appreciate thank you thank being you. here. And again, live fast, die last. Live fast, die last. <laughs> Dead Talks, another episode. Thank you so much, guys. See you next time. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Dead Talks. Please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell. That'll give you updates as to when we post a new video, more episodes, and more content in general. We are streaming on all the major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and all that. And also find us on Instagram at Dead Talks Podcast or www.deadtalks.net. Thank you so much.